Hi everyone and welcome to the Liverpool.com podcast. I am Dan Morgan in the big seat this week, replacing Christian Walsh, who technically has left Liverpool.com. However, as you can probably already see, he's on the call because he just can't get enough as a former Liverpool song goes. Um, So yeah, we've switched roles a little bit. Chris is going to be contributing as a guest. I'll have a go at hosting and uh, and please be nice is what I'd say on your comments uh, because I'll give it my best go. Also got Joel Rabinovitz and Ollie Connolly. So you've got a full quota of Liverpool.com staff, the original Liverpool.com staff uh, this week. And there's a lot to get into after Liverpool 4, Leeds United 3 and what a game it was. Um, Ollie, I'll start with you. I think Mo Salah is everyone's talking point and for good reason. Um, we talk about sort of, I mean, we've talked a lot about maybe the lack of excitement around this season and sort of the trepidation around this season a bit too much as, as a collective supporter base, sort of worrying on what could go wrong. Mo Salah maybe gave us the hint that he's ready for his, his greatest season in a Liverpool shirt. And and that is something to look forward to, undoubtedly. Yeah, I think it, it does reshape the narrative a little, though I, I do find it odd that this kind of idea that there's some renaissance or... He at some point had a dip that he has now returned to. He's just been one of the best players in world football for a sustained period now, or since he joined Liverpool. And he was one of the best players in world football when he was at Roma. So we're going on a six-year stretch now of him being at that absolute, the, the highest level imaginable. Um, so I don't think it should come as much of a surprise. I think that the Leeds game was telling in so much uh, his all-around game was at a level that we we didn't see a whole ton of after the lockdown. Um, and I think Leeds' specific style gave him more chances than maybe other teams will do in the future. Um, but yeah, I mean, you couldn't ask for a, a better start. And uh, But I, I really don't think it's some kind of um, rejuvenation. I think he's just been the special player for, for a long time. Christian, it's, I'm, I'm glad Oli mentions lead style there because I'm, I'm intrigued to what you think is whether this was maybe, I mean, we know Salah's class and we know he's capable of a hat-trick in any given game. But was this maybe a bit of an anomaly? Um, was there maybe a cocktail of things that sort of meant that he had the game he had? Um, I'm, I'm specifically thinking lead style, but also I wonder whether it's been referenced a lot. He gets the ball a lot in the game. And I wonder if he, he, he plays a little deeper because there's a bit of a, a fitness concern around Trent. I wonder whether his starting position's a little deeper and by therefore, you know, he's picking it up deeper. He's able to spin and run. There's, you know where I'm going with this is the sort of does, does the game become a cocktail of things that sort of work in his favour and there's two penalties in there by the way but the you know the performance is marvellous. Yeah, I think it was almost the perfect storm for for Salah. Um, I think I think it's twofold. I think that the thing about the Trent injury is is very interesting. I feel he's not really had much of a preseason. He comes back for England, but that's not really. It is competitive football, but it's not really competitive football. But Liverpool are clearly intent on on managing his, 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 his workload. And you can see that in terms of how Liverpool sort of play away from Trent. It's not necessarily away from him, but I mean, I think I, I said at half-time, Liverpool has had nine or ten shots and, and there was not one single key pass from, from Trent Alexander-Arnold, which is just absolutely... Bananas, really, when you think about the, the output that he had last season. He obviously ends up with a few key passes, uh, particularly from dead balls, by the end of the afternoon. But I think there's there's, there's an element of his, of his fitness. There's an element, and, and look, it wasn't one of his best games. And I think you can you can tell by looking at him, he's not fully fit. Um, but at the same time, I think there was, a, there was an element of, if we call it the Benitez blanket, and what this is, is Leeds clearly felt, right, we're going to stop Trent Alexander-Arnold and Andy Robertson from doing anything on the ball, which is absolutely fine. You can you can put your players on Trent, you can close off the space, you can make sure that he, he's basically penned in. But then that just leaves Mo Salah ahead, just with an absolute free reign. And it's absolutely fine that you've managed to limit Trent Alexander-Arnold to, to, a, to a number of key passes over the 90 minutes. But then Mohamed Salah's got, got a hat-trick. And he's absolutely run riot. And, and for me, put in one of the probably one of the top ten performances in in his Liverpool career. It's interesting how the lack of crowd really sort of almost takes the shine off it because I think if that happens in front of a, a captive audience in front of them at Anfield, 
I think you're you, you, you hailing that as one of the best ever Mo Salah performances. As it was, it was a fantastic performance. It, it was clinical. And it, it, it came about because Leeds took the decision to keep a, a close eye on Trent Alexander-Arnold, which, which freed Mo Salah up to, to do whatever he wanted, to get one-on-one with his right back, uh, with the uh, with the left back. And, you know, it's also said the Benitez blankets. It's one of those where if you pull it up and you, you cover your chest, then it, your toes are going to be sticking out at the end. And I think that's what it's going to be like playing against Liverpool this season because you can stop one, you can stop one threat, you can try and stop two, but you can't stop three or four. And with Trent, with Robertson on, on, on either side, you've got Manny and Salad obviously doing what they do. And then, of course, through the middle, now you've got someone potentially like Naby Keita. Um, he looked quite sharp in the first half. It's, it's going to be almost impossible. It's, it's sort of a pick your poison. How do you want to sort of lose your football game? And uh, Lee sort of chose, you know, sort of death by Salah. Right, prepare yourselves, everyone. Because Joel Rabinovitz has got a new microphone. Um, <laughs> it's it's a wonderful thing. I know everyone on YouTube will be overjoyed at the fact. Joel, he, he seemed... What struck me is he seemed to be enjoying himself. And I think there's a, there's a body of evidence when you watch Salad over the last two years where he looks, just look, looks at times like he's carrying a huge burden. Maybe that's on himself or that's on the expectation that he has a sort of the pillar of Egypt, if you like. Um, but what really struck me and stood out was, I mean, me and Ollie were talking about it post-game when, when we did a Facebook Live, but even the one-two, the continuous one-two in the second half mm. between him and Manny, and they're just laughing about it come, come the end of it. And, you know, we're pulling our hair out, but but they're laughing. But he did he did seem to be enjoying himself. Definitely. Um, I think Salah, you've always got to be careful trying to, describe or, or kind of read into players mentalities from outside because you never know yeah. what they're all thinking but i think salah more than most his body language could be quite telling um there's been periods in his liverpool career previously where you could tell he's not quite happy with himself or there's maybe sort of slight things outside that were bothering him there was a point at which was it beginning of last season there was sort of things going on with the egyptian fa which people said was maybe affecting him somehow. Um, and then he obviously played kind of almost two months of last season, which kind of gets forgotten uh, with an ankle injury, really. Liverpool sort of carried him through that and he played through it, but you could tell wasn't quite himself. And then obviously he had the shoulder problem, uh, which carried on for the end of his first season into kind of the start of the one after that. And I think you can often tell when Salah's really on it. It, it shows, like you said, in, in his mood. Um, and I think there's, there's few players in the world, really, but definitely not in Liverpool squads who who feed off scoring goals like that. And, you know, once he gets his his second goal against Leeds, uh, obviously unbelievable strike, but his game after that, it felt like he was, like you said, playing with a weight off his shoulders. Um, th- there was a, a point, I think it was late in the first half, we picked up near the halfway line and just sort of went past two or three players um, with a neat bit of skill. And there's something, I think, when Salah's confidence is a bit low or he's frustrated with himself, he sometimes doesn't take players on. He kind of second guesses himself and takes the easy pass. Not all the time, but when, when he's really on it, that's when you can sort of tell. And I thought it was interesting uh, after the game, there were some people saying, you know, we've got 2017-18 Salah back. Um, and I see what they mean in terms of the goals, obviously scoring three. Um, but I think even though I don't expect him to hit 44 this season, obviously be delighted if he does, but I almost think he's become slightly more of a complete player since that first season for Liverpool in terms of his all-round contribution he scored a obviously ridiculous amount of goals in that first season, but it often felt like he'd be kind of on the periphery in games and then pop up with a moment and then you wouldn't see him again after that. Uh, whereas now, increasingly, even though he's not scoring at quite the same rate over the last couple of seasons, it is all-round contribution uh, is another level for me. And I think you saw that against Leeds all the way through. He just The Trent thing definitely played into it, but every time he had it, it his touch was on it. His, his passing, decision-making was all there. So I think in terms of what's to come with these two games against Chelsea and Arsenal, for him to kind of get off to that that flying start is massive. I think sometimes, Oli, just a player who win who wins things at the highest mm-hmm. level can do so much for them. You know, it's almost the concept that he gets to sort of just be the best most salary he wants to be now. And and that sort of drive to go and win the golden boot is is enough because he knows that Liverpool at the business end are going to be in and about it. You know, they yeah. have enough faith in each other that, that they can. And the other thing to mention as well is that I think Joel makes a really good point. But, you know, I, I wrote this piece on the pill.com the other day and I wasn't being salty. 
But if Liverpool get half of Manchester United's penalties, and he is Liverpool's penalty taker this season, then, you know, there's an extra sort of nine goals to his game, if you like. Yeah. I mean, he scored. We can have, we can, we can joke about it, but he scored six out of his last six penalties for Liverpool. And if he decides he's taking them and putting them away, and Liverpool get more than the six they got last season, then he's got every right to think that he can, he can sort of get towards the forty mark. And obviously, take Joel's context of that he is a better rounder player. Yeah, I think Joel makes a great point because he has these kind of two ebbing and flowing personalities almost. He has those ones where he's almost upset with the manner with which he scored the goal when he gets like angry in a celebration, <laughs> like it wasn't quite what he wanted to do, but and it went in the net. That's not good enough. And there's the smiley assassin element, which is like when he's clearly having fun. Oh my god, I'm so brilliant and this is so easy. I love doing this. This is this is dope. And I think Mane is one way all the time, and then he kind of flips between the two of them, and you kind of can just sense it when it's like, oh, he's on today, like Joel said. He'll skip past the player, burst to the final third, and you're like, oh, most we're having it today. And he'll score every week regardless. But it's just the this kind of personality construct of how, of how he's feeling. And, and I do think there's a, an element of rounding into shape because at Roma, he was a complete creator. He was the chief creator of the whole team. Everything ran through him. Then, like Joel said, when he first came to Liverpool, it was kind of a poacher, but playing on the right wing where he would maybe drift through a game, but he would, he would put the ball in the net. And I thought last season was kind of the combination of the two of more all-around play. And if that can continue into this year, where he is, he's just the, the almost the full focal point. Uh, the, the creative burden that takes off the, the fullbacks, that it takes off having to. It, we've all been discussing will the new movement pattern be that they have to go more centrally? You know, we talk about Thiago, we talk about what will Fabinho do in the build-up play. What about Gomez or Matip and kind of them building centrally? If Mo Salah is just an unplayable force, the only thing Gary Neville got right, I thought, in his analysis on Monday Night Football was that Ronaldo went to such a level that it was just game over because you had to commit so much focus to him that all of a sudden you have other people popping up there. Tevez, uh, Rooney, Liverpool would have Mane, Firmino, Robertson, Trent Alexander-Arnold. If he can push it to this whole other level, then it's it's a wrap. And I think that that kind of like small minor growth within the squad it is as important as anything bringing something else in, in trying to retain the title. I'll just come back to you really quickly because I think that's, I think the one thing that, that often gets lost and it shouldn't, and, and I think it was a lot of the case last year, is that he and, and Manny, for that, for that matter, remain team players. You know, everything they do in terms of their goal scoring instincts and their, and their desires, they, they sort of never lose heart of their value to the team and what they need to give to the shape and and to the fullback or to the centre midfielder at any one time. It's sort of the essence of this team, if you like, of knowing where to be on the pitch at any one time. But Salah, for all for all the criticism, if you like, that he gets, he never goes away from being that team player. No, he's first in shot since he came to the Premier League, first in touch in the box, but he's also fourth in shot assists. You know, it's it's like it's because he's so unbelievably impressive as a goal scorer, the creative side of his game is completely overlooked. The same thing, like I said, happened with Ronaldo. When you get these kind of straight line, physically unbelievable players flying in off the wing, they get kind of pigeonholed as that like one direct player, and they get a little bit of the genius label. I mean, he is as much part of the collective as, as anyone else. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Chris, the, the the narrative around the summer, if you like, has been. A strange one, as we know, and we've touched on it a few times in terms of sort of the transfer panic. I think we, we're we not, you know, out of line in calling it. I think what you get to see Saturday is sort of the excitement that these are actually, even though the, the sort of season pros and, and the, the players you feel like they've been at Liverpool for a lifetime, they're in the prime. You know, and these are probably the next two years, the prime Mo Salah years, the prime Sadio Mane years, the the prime Firmino years, you know, there's, you're not, you're not backing a bad horse if you, if you're Jurgen Klopp saying that we believe that for two years they can maintain this level. I think this has been massively forgotten, and I'm from myself as well included. Sometimes where the the desire for signings and the the absolute necessity to see something fresh kind of completely and utterly masks and negates what Liverpool have already got. As you say, that is a, a team that's won the Champions League and won the Premier League in the past 18 months and are now collectively moving into the primes together. That's that's remarkable, really. That's that's something that you, you very rarely get to see um, around football. I, I think I think one of the only times we've seen it, really, is, is potentially the Real Madrid team, that three pieces for the, for the Champions League. I think you potentially kind of saw it. Man United 0709. 
Um, you could maybe extend that a little bit more. Obviously, Ronaldo goes, but they do it for a couple of more years still towards the back end of Ferguson. I think there's maybe a little bit of Arsenal in that in 04. But, you know, even those sort of teams would, would generally rail aside maybe, but add one or two here and there. I think what Saturday proved, and this isn't me saying, look, Liverpool are right to absolutely sign nobody. I think you look at the bench and you think, well, there's probably a little bit more depth that they need there. Uh, you look at sort of the the options, especially up front, and you think, well, if Firmino's having a bit of a, a quiet game, which he did, he didn't have his best game, what does Liverpool have in terms of bringing her off the bench? But that aside, when you look at the, the starting 11 and a couple of those around, the 12, the 13, the 14, if you look at that core of players, why, why would you break those up? Why would you even contemplate upsetting any sort of equilibrium that they have? Because... They are moving together. They are the continuity is going to be massive this season. Uh, it's going to be massive in any sort of sport, I think, in terms of because there's been so little time to get training sources, to get new transfer signings bedded in, to get any new ideas across properly, and because the games are going to become so thick and fast, there's going to be fewer minutes on on the training pitch. Continuity is going to be a massive thing this season. And Liverpool will have it more than anybody else because they've got a team that's won the Champions League, won the Premier League, or sans Dejan Lovren. Apart from him, the, 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 the squad is still together. It's remained together. It's the, the proven winners. And they're, they're ready to, as you say, enter their prime of 27, 28, 29. It, it, it's, it's a recipe to, to continue success. Yes, I think Liverpool probably do need a couple of more signings. But ultimately, don't disregard what Liverpool already have, and, and that's a that's an incredible football team and an incredible setup around them. Just just to make a real quick point about the, the continuity, just throw this out there to everyone: of the eight games, so sixteen clubs, eight games. How many new signings do you think started for uh, their teams at the weekend? Collectively. Collectively. So Liverpool was zero, obviously. Um, and I'm not counting somebody like uh, Ben White, for example, because he's yeah. been at Brighton before. I'm not counting somebody like uh, Suchek at West Ham because, yes, they signed him on a, on, a, on a permanent transfer, but he was there last season. How many new arrivals have uh, started over the weekend? So under 10? Must no. be over 10. I was going to say somewhere 12. around 20. 12. 17, which is basically one, one a team. Yeah. Um, Liverpool and West Ham zero, West Brom, Leicester, Sheffield United, Wolves and Brighton one, um, Leeds two, Spurs two, Chelsea two, and then Newcastle and Everton three. And to be fair, Newcastle and Everton more than most teams needed the Simons and and, and you're not seeing Sigurdsson starting over to Corey, for example. What we saw there this in, in this opening weekend is very much a as you were. It's almost a continuation of the season before. Now, OK, Liverpool have had a little dip post-lockdown. They had a little bit of a dip post-title win. But ultimately, it's the same team that has won the Champions League and won the Premier League. And if we're going by the Liam Gallagher mantra, as, as you are, as you were, then Liverpool have got to be sort of bang up there once again. Well, one thing on that quickly, Dan, I know you're big on this. These people are pathological winners. And I know I'm not a pathological winner, so I don't know how to get to that mindset. When you see Alex Oxley chamberlain say, we are not discussing the championship, I've never even heard anyone mention it. I, that, I don't think that is PR spin. I think that is genuine. I think these people are such high achievers, particularly someone like a seller and a club. I think they, they their brain frequency and how they're thinking about this is just different to how we would even look at it outside. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I mean that's it, Joel. I mean, to start wrapping up on Salah, I think I think it's important to distinguish between when we talk about transfers, we're not talking about cover. We're happy to sort of I think collectively, if I'm talking for the group of of us, we're happy to say yeah, Liverpool could improve in terms of getting cover for for the front three, getting cover for certain positions. We would have liked as much as anyone for them to have done some business there. There was an insinuation in, in certain quarters though in the summer that you know maybe the fire won't burn. Maybe maybe they might be fatigued too early. Maybe maybe they've played too much football. And then I think there's all there's also this kind of weird Liverpool thing that, that sticks around is that I remember sort of eighteen, nineteen, 
everyone just weirdly assuming Salah was going to leave the following season <laughs> and go and play for Real Madrid. It's Taurus and syndrome, it was, Taurus it was, syndrome. It, it, is, yeah. it is. It was absolutely based on nothing. Like there was no credible links. There was no, but it was just like, oh yeah, he'll go there. <laughs> and, and I mean, yeah, he's linked with Barcelona now very tenuously. But I mean, those sorts of things, that's where we are, are making the, the, the distinction, aren't we? Yeah, I think it's we've all become so used to a mindset where a player reaches a certain level and they inevitably just go to one of the big Spanish clubs. And I think we need to sort of break out of that a little bit. And not to say that won't necessarily happen with one of the front three over the next couple of years. I don't think it will be at the end of this season. I could be proven wrong, but I think you're right in terms of, of Salah and, and all of the front three, really. There's, there's a danger in that yearning for something new and something fresh and exciting like Chelsea have. Um, it can sort of cloud what you have there, which is to be enjoyed um, as long as they are. And, you know, like you watched Chelsea last night and I think they'll go on to have a good season. I fully expect them to finish top four, probably top three. Um, but that that's going to take time to gel. You've got your players like Havertz and Werner. And I know not all their new signings played yesterday, but that is that is one jigsaw Lampard's got to sort out there. And I think Christian's point about continuity is massive. It was the same last season as well. Um the only worry, I suppose, and when we talk about the, the cover issue, is the reason you would want signings is almost is to keep the front three in, in peak form and fitness for as long as you possibly can. And whilst I think desire and, and the, the the wanting to win an avatar was not an issue in terms of kind of, it's not like they just won one and they're going to be satisfied. But I think it's there is a lot of football and there has been such a short break, not just kind of the, the, the gap has just gone between 1920 and 2021, but you've got to remember the international commitments all these players have been through. Um, that, that for me is still a slight concern. And I think obviously we've still got well, it's what 20 days today, isn't it, until the window's over. But I still look at that team and think we need that Salah for as much of a scene as, as possible. Um, and I think you do risk sort of burnout and fatigue if you don't have the cover there so uh, I hope Liverpool do do something about that um, but yeah in terms of where they are now I think you've just got to relish it because it's like nothing we've really seen before. On Barcelona and Salah just really quickly I'd, I'd, I'm not quite sure how the how that's even a thing what, 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 what a Barcelona they, got no more. they would have to basically bring the Camp Nou to Liverpool um, as part of the deal and, and stick it in front of Bramley Moor. So that's the first thing that Birkenhead sees. Um, that's the only way I can see any sort of Liverpool-Barcelona deal for Mo Salah happening is basically if you give us your stadium. Yeah, it was... It was it, it, it isn't happening, by the way. That's not me saying that. No. <laughs> Don't quote me, Anfield's... Smoke, smoke and mirrors was... Um was kind to the rumour, put it that way. I mean, just on continuity and all these points of, of pathological winners, Chris, what what I think you get from the Leeds game is it, it's really it's really sort of easy for me to say this and I might get panned for it, but I think if you take the goals against out of the equation and you take sort of the chances missed out of the equation, I'm actually quite pleased with how Liverpool performed. Because I think it's forgotten in the game that Liverpool come back from sort of being pegged back three times to win the game. And I think when you're sort of asking those existential questions about is that fire still there? Can this team go to the well? It shouldn't have to. I need to make that point. It shouldn't have to a lot of the time. It makes life difficult for itself. But if this manager is sort of looking around that dressing room at full time, I think, I think his mindset is much more of yeah, these lads have still got the fire. They still want to go again. They still, they still have that desire to go and, to go and win things, and, and that desire to just purely win over ninety minutes. That being said, there is a, there is an issue around defending. We can't get away from it. Um, Andrew Beasley wrote an excellent piece for us this week on Liverpool.com. I think it went out yesterday, um, and he highlights the the problems that we've had with with defending. I mean, the Leeds game's really interesting because their XG ranged from 0.4 to 0.6, which means that basically every shot they had went in. And really, really, uh, from what Andrew says, there's still fewer than 50 examples where that actually happens um, with an XG like that. That being said, you know, there is, there is a body of evidence behind this now that 
I think I think from the stats, if I'm right, we've conceded 26 in the last 15, going back to West Ham at home. So that's sort of pre-lockdown. Um, what, what's your take on it? Where, where do you think this is stemming from? What do you think the main issue is with it? I think a lot of it is you've got to look deeper into the numbers. I'm not as concerned about the defence as, as many people. I feel, I think Josh Williams wrote a really good piece on, on the Echo, funnily enough, um, and he sort of looked at it as well, and I, I agree with him that if these teams who've come and put three past Liverpool, Chelsea, Leeds, Salzburg, absolutely fine because that's how they've played. They've loaded the box, they've had midfield runners beyond, but ultimately in those games, Liverpool have scored four, four and five. And while Liverpool and my heart and my ever receding hairline cannot take a season of four threes and five threes at the same time if these teams basically if you come at the king you best not miss and a lot of teams are coming at the king they're not necessarily missing but the king's coming back twice as strong and i think what liverpool this won't happen very often for liverpool i don't think i think the west ham game is, is one of the few ones where they collectively defended badly i think you can look at the chelsea game and write that off as a liverpool have just won the title and they're about to go on an all mighty bender i'm putting two extra time at let's go goals in there as well by the way so yeah over 90 minutes you can't really count them yeah exactly so there's that you've got the um you've got the game against leeds obviously which is just uh, look the, in terms of see what you want to say about xg but ultimately norwich created better chances than leeds did yeah. Liverpool gave Norwich more chances on the opening day last season than they did to Leeds. It's just that Norwich's goals did not go in and, and Leeds's did. Um, that doesn't necessarily say that's that's okay. But I think I think the, the raw number of, what was it, 26 and 15? Yeah, that's what I make it, 26 in the yeah, last 15. I think the raw number of that is, is maybe not quite as reflective as what's going on. I think you've got to take into consideration the post-title. I think that's a big issue. Four of those goals come against Man City in a game that was just absolutely bizarre. Three of them come against Chelsea in a game where they're just sort of ready for the for the title winning party. And basically Christian Pulisic for 10 minutes decides to go absolutely crazy on Liverpool. And three of those have come against the lead side who score with every shot on target in one of those really strange games. I think I delved into the numbers a little bit and I looked at sort of XG per game from those so I've, i cut it off at the i think it was the not i think i started with the west ham game so i cut it off the norwich one nil i think it was um maybe not i can't remember slightly but basically there was a difference of about in, in terms of xg per game conceded it was around about a 0.2 difference which is probably an extra goal once every five games now look this isn't science and it's not absolutely uh you know a formula that necessarily works but i think if you and it's easy to make excuses and it's not necessarily an excuse but if you look at the situation of the more goals are going in because basically it's a bit of a regression to the mean because liverpool were massively overperforming especially because of allison and now that's slightly coming back i think secondly the four against city the three against chelsea and the three against leeds have to be taken into consideration likewise as you say the two extra time goals uh, against atletico there's a bit of an asterisk against all of those for, for one reason or another um and then yeah finally i just feel like it's 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 they're not actually creating they're not actually i think you could write a fair bit of this off as a lack of concentration as maybe a, a little bit of i don't want to say arrogance from Virgil van dyke but just that basically liverpool's defense have been on it for so long so so well and if that just slips for five ten seconds then it's going to sort of have a big impact on on the the, the overall figure so you know you look at some of the goals they've been conceding and van dyke against Leeds is the perfect example i think that's just cobwebs and i think when you've had a player who's been on it for so long so much any tiny sort of slip mentally will will be will be noticeable and, and will force a goal the only one thing i would say um well maybe two actually the only two things i want to raise is this gomez question because I don't feel like, certainly post-lockdown, um, he's been anywhere near the player that we, we know he can be. 
and I would almost argue Matip should be ahead of him in the pecking orders. I know we spoke about this last week. And number two, there's a slight concern, not a massive concern, but just an ever so slight concern about the regression of the mean where it comes to Alison Becker. I think he's still one of the best goalkeepers in the world. I think Liverpool are fortunate to have him. Wouldn't swap him for absolutely anybody else in the world. But he's letting in goals now, which he wasn't letting in previously. Now, that's either because, A, he was that good, he should have been letting them in in the first place. Or B, again, it's just a slight regression to the mean where he's maybe not moving his feet quite as quickly. He's maybe not concentrating as much as he was. Maybe he's somebody who thrives on the fact that he's got fans behind him. I don't know. He's not necessarily at the level, albeit a very high level, of what he was post, uh, pre-lockdown. Is there something in, Oli, how we defend with with all of this? Because, I mean, you've seen the ridiculous ESPN tweet about Van Dyke <laughs> and Edith's leading to goals. And it's the old, for me, it's the old Joe Allen syndrome. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I can pass the ball sideways for 90 minutes and my stats will look brilliant. But how much have I actually impacted? You know, Liverpool's defenders can have the argument, yeah, I can sit in a low block and win 95% of aerial duels and, and get five out of five blocks and clearances in a game. But Liverpool defend in such a high wire act. Literally, you know, they are Liverpool Liverpool will we talk about Chris talks about science. Liverpool will calculate a percentage of chance that they, they're willing to give away each game because not only do they back the goalkeeper or whatever else, they, they sort of just they have found a way to sort of play a game of football whilst also playing the odds continuously. And we've seen that a lot. You know, we've seen... I, I remember Watford at home last season, I think, and I'm in my seat in the cop, and I think it was someone like Decore was bearing down about 18 yards from goal, and Van Dijk was just telling them to shoot. You shoot from there. You shoot because I back the keeper. Here's the angle I'm giving you to shoot. You haven't got the whole goal to aim at, but you shoot from there, and I'm absolutely fine with it. And there is something in just sort of... A mistake to a Liverpool defender defending in this system is a lot more deadly to, you know, James me, uh, James Tarkowski or Ben me. Yeah. I don't think there's a systemic flaw. It's not like they can see the same type of goal over and over again. And if you if you look at the Leeds game, they made tactical flaws in the first half that we covered on the site earlier in the week that they corrected for the second half. There, there was a massive difference in the way they defended, just the, the two centre-backs. They were basically putting Joe Gomez in a lurking role in the first half. And, you know, Klopp spoke about how bad he thought the defensive line was. They were trying to have him sag off a little bit deeper and sweep up behind it. They pushed Virgil van Dijk on the ball so much higher up the pitch than Gomez was. And it was a, it was a whiff. They, they got it wrong. In the second half, they went back. To, usually, they just work in tandem. One goes, one stays. Like the classic type, almost Terry Carvalho stuff. They just kind of instinctively understand when one should go like you said they go one-on-one -on -one. they just kind of get it with each other and they did that in the second half and then they pushed the defensive line so much higher up the pitch you can see this the wise guy has great tracking data of how high the defensive line is and it just creeps up and creeps up and they just pushed it higher and higher and higher until they suffocated leads and that's their style and i think chris nailed it at the end there way i thought it was a blowing off the cobwebs type of thing i think van dyke is not going to make those kind of individual errors all the time i thought gomez was poor in the first half i thought he was really good the second half i thought he switched on uh, he, he seemed engaged and I think it was really like okay now we're back at it that was really intense like you've mentioned Dan throughout the Leeds game they really fit they're just on you right away and it's like okay I have to re-raise my level to where we were at post lockdown I think they I think it was great I think they needed it I think it was a real wake-up call and once uh, Alexander Arnold gets back to full fitness and they can kind of work on the shape more as Klopp mentioned after the game this isn't a thing you do you just switch on on and off you know they have to work on this now the form have to get back um, and, and just drill it and, and go and go. So I, I don't see any kind of systemic flaw that I think is an issue. They do not concede the same kind of goals over and over again. Leeds created decent chances, moments of individual brilliance, and, and took them. Where are you with it, Joel? It, it, was, it was very sort of pre-season-y still, in, in a sense, and maybe, maybe we just have to come to expect that. Yeah, I'd say I'm, I'm slightly more concerned than some of you about it because I think Ollie's point about not being able to just turn this on and off like a tap is is crucial here. Um, it's been a long, long time. I know the three months without football kind of warps everything, but it's been a really long time since Liverpool were regularly keeping clean sheets. Um, and a lot, it's it's not just the volume of goals they've conceded, but it's it's the ease with which those goals have been scored uh, in different ways. I think back to. Games like West Ham at home, uh, which we've already mentioned here, but that that one was just 
it felt like all they had to do, I think it was the equaliser from four nows in the second half there was basically just, it was quite a similar goal to Leeds' third actually at the weekend across from the right-hand side, which basically all they had to do was was kind of progress up the pitch and kick it into the box and the guys seemed to have unlimited time to shoot. Um, even the Atletico one, I know Adrian's role in that has, has been spoken about a lot, but the way they got to that position on the pitch felt too easy. Again, with the Leeds' first goal, it was just one long punt and they were basically in. Um, again, Trent and Gomez should do better, but the ease with which the, the midfield was bypassed, I think that perhaps is an underrated problem here uh, in terms of Liverpool's defence because, it's, it's again, it's been a long time really since Liverpool had a kind of cohesive, solid midfield three or at least a kind of regular one. It's been a lot of chopping and changing, especially since the restart with Henderson's injury. Fabinho's kind of had a, a very strange 2020 in terms of form and injury. Uh, we've seen flashes of him at his best, but not kind of a prolonged period. And you think when Liverpool's defence has looked most settled on the clock, it's been when Henderson and Fabinho have both been in the team together, probably with one out and for a sustained period of time. And you, you haven't had that at all this entire calendar year, really. Uh, you've had Henderson obviously had that brilliant period when Fabinho was out injured. And then his injury almost came when Fabinho was kind of back in form. And you've had Naby Keita coming in out of the team. Curtis Jones getting bits and pieces here and there. And I think that that was really evident against Leeds that the, there was a lot of space, as much as the individual defenders, Van Dijk and Gomez particularly, should have done better and can do better. There was an awful lot of space uh, where it didn't take Leeds to do very much to sort of be in right at the back four. So, yeah, that does slightly concern me, I have to say, against Chelsea and Arsenal. Um, again, there was something similar in the Community Shield. The first goal was basically one big switch, like the Calvin Phillips pass. I think it was Saka played that one to Aubameyang for the first goal in that game. Um, so, yeah, I hope and, and I think it's quite possible that it does come with time and once players sort of gain their rhythm and, and get back into this drive. But, yeah, it, it would be nice to sort of see Liverpool not giving teams the hope, I think, again, because Leeds, it felt like Leeds were never out of that game, really. All right. Um, we're going to wrap up soon. I just want to run through. So on the pill.com last week, before the season kicked off, we've done 15 predictions for the Premier League season. And scenes as we're one game in, I want to just go through some with you and see if you're still sticking to your guns. So, oh. so first and foremost, let's go with the big one, title winners. We all, bar Christian, had Liverpool. Chris had Man City. Are we all still in agreement with our original choices there? I haven't seen anything from Man City to uh, to suggest that they're not going to win the league. Still. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the top four predictions were predominantly Liverpool, City, Chelsea and Manchester United. However, I went Liverpool, Man City, Chelsea and Arsenal. And I will invite all three of you to change your mind now because our Arsenal will be this season's dark horse. I am telling you now. They look good. They looked really good. I think Aubameyang is is capable of a, of having a Suarez like season, a real talisman, a talismanic season. I feel the defense is looking a little bit better. I feel there's more of a co cohesive plan there. I, I back Arteta. They've, they've figured out who the number one goalkeeper is. I just feel like, I'm, and it's it's crazy because we grew up with with Arsenal winning things, but. I just think it's really Arsenal to not to, to, to throw things away. And I can just see Arsenal going on in a game streak of the victory and all of a sudden they're down in eighth and Gunasaurus is, is on the bench. They're, they're oddly defensive. They sit in a real low block and they just kind of let yeah. three guys up top go for it. Yeah. They, they, they had really weird stats from the weekend about how many actions and passes they have in the opponent's half. They, it is not at all what you would picture in your mind's eye of, oh, there's that you know collective attacking talent and here's Mikel Arteta from Wenger and Guardiola. He's just like, no, we're going to sit in a low block. I don't trust any of these defensive lads uh, and I want to let the, the front three go have fun. A lot of switches at play. A mm. lot. Um, I'm, I'm going to have some fun with this one. Surprise package team. Right. Um, I'm just, again, again, not to blow my own trumpet, but I did, I did say Arsenal. Um, but for, for everyone else, Ollie Connolly, Southampton. Uh, they won the XG battle, mate. You know, what can you say? This is Fair 2020. Play. They won the XG battle. Fair play. Christian Walsh, Brighton and Hove Albion. I thought they were. I thought they were really good against Chelsea. I thought again they won the XG. They won the XG. 
He's, okay. he's at the XG with us. I, I still think they'll be fine. I still think they'll be absolutely fine. Last but not least, Joel, <laughs> West Ham. <laughs> the only thing I've got to say on this is I did preface it with saying this could quite easily come back to make me look stupid. Yeah. So they've been somewhere Sorry, I can part I took six days. Six days it took. <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait in December. Just <laughs> um, first manager sacked. We've got Bilic, Lampard, Steve Bruce, um, and Dean Smith. I don't think we've seen anything that will sort of sway us either way on those. Although, big shout to Jose Mourinho um, for putting himself in the running. Um, golden boot. So, Sadio Mane from Oli. I foolishly went for Roberto Firmino, so that's my West Ham egg in face. <laughs> um, Pierre Merrick Abamyang from Joel and Mohamed Salah from Chris. Um, Did I not go Salah? Or was that on my last podcast? I think it I must have been the last podcast, yeah. yeah. You're down for a bad Well, I'm yeah. changing to Mona. <laughs> oh, fair play, fair play. <laughs> well, uh, I have one change each. Have we seen anything from anyone else who we think could be a dark horse? Not along with that, because that, that group's going to be, I think, it's such a clip that it's, it would have to have been Vardy coming out with you know a crazy effort. And I, I can't see anyone keeping pace with those two. I'm intrigued yeah. by Vardy in general. You just assume that every season's going to be the one where he <laughs> eventually stops. And I know it was... It was penalties, but even still, you wouldn't be surprised if he's somehow up there again, even though he's, was he, 34 now? Mm-hmm. I wouldn't rule out to Richarlison or Calvert-Lewin. You're so, into this. You're so into this Everton um, Renaissance. It's I mad. Am, I'm actually into Calvert-Lewin. I think he's a really good player. And I think he's going to score about 20 goals like Duncan Ferguson. But just watch that Watch that Tottenham game back if you've got any reason to do so whatsoever. Don't know why you would, but if you do watch Tottenham Everton back... Um, Rich Allison has, a, I think, he has the second most shots in 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 the Premier League this week, just behind Mo Salah. And I mean, obviously, there's a one where he misses for four yards out, so that makes me look a bit of a mug. But the, he gets in the right positions, and and Rodriguez keeps on finding them. He probably won't get it as easy as as he will every week that he did against Matt Doherty, who I think had one of the worst debuts I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, he did. He, he, he looked like me, like, eight, eight, <laughs> eight miles into a, into a half marathon. Like, he looked absolutely, and sadly, like, he couldn't take me off, but he, he was absolutely gone. Um, so he won't have it that easy, but he was picking up some really nice positions, a couple of decent efforts. I think, have a look at Calvert Luna or Richarlison as a little, uh, little surprise package from the back. I really like Dominic Calvert Luna, I've got to say. Oh, I did, I, I Absolutely, very, very athletic. Um, a good player, like you say. Best header of the ball in the Premier League for me. I mean, that was outrageous. That header. It was a really good header, despite the fact Eric Dyer was facing the other way. <laughs> <laughs> he literally like he's facing away from his goal. I just couldn't. Oh God! He's the, he's the worst player than Eric Dyer. Like pound for pound in terms of hype versus reality. Oh. Did you see him in the All or Nothing documentary? He, no one comes across worse than him. I put him in my fantasy team for this season. <laughs> You're West Ham alone by January. <laughs> it's good value on the face of it, but they don't keep clean sheets. So, so last couple. Um, dead interest in this one because no one's actually got Mo Salah, but Liverpool's most valuable player. So, Ollie, you went for Sadio. I went for James Milner, which is mad. Um, <laughs> What was I on last week? Joel, <laughs> uh, you went for Bobby and Chris. Good show for Trent. Is anyone changing their mind? Because I think I might. No, I'm good. No, I'll stay yeah, good. I, I think I think I'll sw- switch to Mo. Um, surprising moment of the season. Um, no, in, in fact, let's go to let let's pick another one. I'll so lose my got... Carlo shout in there, I think, which is looking it's looking pretty good. Okay, let's do that. Let's that surprising <laughs> moment of the season. Uh, Oli, you went Carlo Ancelotti walks out on Everton. Yeah, uh, I think you see what's happening at PSG. My whole thing was that Tuchel would be out by Christmas, and it's—I don't know if you've looked what's happening over there, but it's—it's it's not going great. Fair play. They're going to have yeah. to change those Bramley Moore plans. It's currently got a massive statue of Carlo out there. <laughs> well, just on that, Chris. I have been reading this afternoon, um, but that's for another time. Um, Look at the Guardian if you if you're wondering what I'm on about. Um, mine was Manchester United lose ten away games in feeble fashion, look devoid for two thirds of a season and fail to reach the Champions League, and only going to Solskjaer remains in a job and anybody following the club doesn't say a thing, which I think is a pretty sound bet to be fair, even though we've not seen anything of them. Um, Joel, 
you were very close actually to fulfilling this. Mo Salah wins an actual penalty for being oh. fouled in the box. <laughs> I'll take uh, you take that. that. Keep, yeah. keep winning handballs all day. That's fine. Yeah. Christian, another Manchester United centre one. Bruno Fernandes output goes down. You back in that? Absolutely. They're not Liverpool are gonna get all the Man United's penalties this season. I will absolutely take that and I'm right on board with that shout. Um last one, we'll do it. Pick a headline you'll definitely read this season. Ollie, official Thiago Alcantara signs for Liverpool. You still back in that shout? I I believe still. <laughs> Do you, uh, the, do you want to say about the Thiago thing? I, mean, it's more, I, I don't think there's anything in it now. I can sort of go on the record now and don't think it's going to happen. I don't think... I can, I, I don't think... I think it's just an absolute buy-and-driven thing where they're, they're probably desperate to get him off the wage bill, even though he's a brilliant player. I don't think there's any interest from Liverpool's angle, not, not like concrete interest. But I can sort of, watching that Leeds game, understand why they might want him. Because I, I, he feels like he's very superb superfluous, which is also ironically very superfluous words. But I feel like if you look at that team and if, if people are trying to mark out Trent and Robertson and if people are trying to get Salah and, and Mane sort of and pen them in, imagine having someone like Tiago Alcantara just like pulling the strings down the middle. It'd be absolutely incredible. Sadly, there's more chance of me signing for, uh, for Man United. <laughs> On that, um, so the next one was mine, which was James Rodriguez, amazing 50-yard sprint and slide tackle after tracking back on a January night in Burnley. Um, I'm still backing that show, to be fair. I think he played really well the other day, but um, I think I think he'll feel some tightness in his hamstring come those, those early dark winter nights. Joel, you came very close again. Jose Mourinho piles more misery on sink and spares after <laughs> inevitably falling out with one of his best and most important players like he usually does. I mean, you feel very close to these headlines already, mate. If you can give us the yeah. odds, uh, if you can give us the lottery numbers for this week, that'd be, I'd be really appreciative. Um, what I would say is that's wait, not that, me. Sorry, well, go on, Ollie. That's got a uh, new on me written all over it. Harry Kane lays down lays down the, the, the ticket to Daniel Levy. It's one, it's one or the other. Uh, yeah. there's, there's two things with that. Number one, SEO, Joel, what have we saw? Yeah, that's not very good, SEO. <laughs> uh, number two, it, it almost, I loved in this post-match interview, like he said that there was laziness and he couldn't he couldn't leave it there. He had to sort of specify where it was coming from and it says up front. <laughs> so it's just sort of like, it's, it's like, it's you guys. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. It's absolutely, it's you guys. I'm picking a fight with you. I'm going to pick a fight with the club captain, the 25-year-old <laughs> superstar. No problem. He's not going to last by November, is he? Yeah, no, so we're going to need volume two of the, the <laughs> to run this season. Yes, somewhere in Milan, you know, Romelu Lukaku and and uh, Sanchez were, were quietly laughing to themselves <laughs> um, on a Sunday afternoon. Lastly, from you, Chris, Jurgen flop up for cop chop. Glad I got that right. <laughs> After dropping four points behind Manchester City in the title race at some point in February. Absolutely spot on. Um, thank you, everyone, this week. Please enjoy Liverpool.com as much as, as you can, as much as we are writing. We are going to be giving you loads of content from what's to come, what's gone. Um, looking back towards the archives, we've got a brand new writer joining us next week in Mark Wakefield. We've got some new features and some new content coming. Stay with us, um, check out everything, and we'll be here for all you need, hopefully. Take care. See you soon. <laughs>